All right, welcome back from lunch. Um, and networking. <laughs> Our next panel is serving a multilingual community. We have Maynard Martinez, Librarian 2 with Mountain View Public Library. Yay! <laughs> Joe Stoner, the Library Manager for the Newark Branch of the Alameda County Library. Shima Avalos, Adult Services Manager. <laughs> with uh, Mission Branch, San Francisco Public Library, and Richard Lee, Branch Manager for the North Beach Branch. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tierney. Good afternoon to everybody. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, throughout my time with the city of Mountain View, I've been fortunate enough to serve several multilingual communities. And um, I want to focus today on our Chinese and our Latinx communities, uh, respectively. The Career Success Allowance Program is a pilot program is, that's running until June of 2025. It runs in conjunction with our online high school program that began in 2022. And it provides monetary support for students trying to earn their high school diplomas and credentialed career certificate. The applicant has to meet certain requirements, including being 19 years of age or older, living or working in Mountain View, having a Mountain View Public Library card, committing at least 10 hours a week to coursework, and being comfortable reading, writing, and speaking in English. Students who then meet these requirements must take an online survey, complete a prerequisite course in two weeks, and continue to meet achievement goals. They do this, they receive a monthly stipend of $720, which is for the duration of the course, which could be up to 18 months. Now this is absolutely huge. If you are um, kind of hampered by daycare uh, needs and you can definitely use that money to achieve your educational goals. Our Spanish Language Civic Leadership Academy, um, we began this program in 2017. This allows participants to gain awareness of city functions. Every week, they go to a different city department and are greeted by the department head and additional staff to better understand issues of concern. The program leaders say that these academies produce positive outcomes, which include a broad support of two-way communication between residents and city staff, a sense of pride and civic engagement, and a pipeline to commissions, boards, and elected positions for interested residents. I feel that the best positive outcome is how the civic academies and the high school programs complement each other. There have been civic leadership academy members who through awareness of our services have decided to finish their education and there have been members of the online high school um, programs still fresh off obtaining their diploma that have become inspired to learn more and get involved with civic engagement. And not to be undone, the Chinese Language Civic Academy was started in 2022 on the heels of the success from its Spanish predecessor. The popularity and success of these programs has been such that we received 25 simultaneous translation devices through a grant from none other than Pacific Library Partnership, shout out PLP. And depending on what type of language is spoken, the city will provide a translator. Our ESL Conversation Club is a program we've held for over a decade where various non-native English speakers are welcomed into a friendly social setting and meet with other non-native speakers, introduce themselves, and delve into a number of topics which could include anything from family and friends to technology and hobbies. They receive handouts with key vocabulary words, idioms, and discussion questions. During and after COVID, 
the Conversation Club was offered as a hybrid program. And as Zoom evolved into its ubiquitous form of communication, participants would have family and friends join in from all over the world, including China, Japan, Nepal, India, Brazil, and Mexico, to name a few countries. And now a regular class consists of about 15 to 20 participants and five to 10 members on Zoom. We also collaborate with the Chinese Health Initiative of El Camino Hospital for talks on health and wellness. We do this a couple of times a year. And every year, we have translators on hand from the IRS to provide free tax assistance, uh, primarily in Spanish. We offer bilingual story times, Spanish and English, and a Mandarin story time. Our programs include finger plays, lap jogs, and stories through books, puppets, or flannel boards, and music. Without a doubt, however, I'd say the most effective way of delivering services to our multilingual communities has been through outreach. There are multiple senior facilities in Mountain View that we visit, in addition to the large number of Chinese and Latinx community members that we serve. This stop that you see here um, has a large number of Russian-speaking residents. We laminated a Russian a uh, translated library card application, and though most of the people were able to speak a little bit of English, they definitely appreciated the gesture of seeing their home language on an application. Move Mountain View is a program that helps unhoused individuals or families by providing a safe place to park and sleep along with bathrooms and hand washing stations seven days a week. There are numerous lots around Mountain View, and each client gets a case manager, and they work together to examine their challenges and try to move them towards um, achieving their housing goals. I rotate through about four different parks throughout Mountain View, and I provide a story time. Um, and although there are some families that will join us at different locations uh, every month, the majority of the families that um, participate are in walking distance to the park who obviously would normally uh, not be able to make it. And aside from providing regular service to all schools in the district, we also go to back to school nights, school resource fairs, etc. The picture on the left was a back to school night where we issued over 100 cards, uh, library cards in one hour, and the one on the right was at a dual immersion school in the district. Um, I'm proud of the work that we've done in Mountain View, and I'm actually very proud of the people that I serve with. Um, a lot of them are here. Shout out Mountain View. Um, and I don't think any organization has cornered the market on serving multilingual communities. Um, but something that I've learned throughout the years that bears mention is people will continuously come to a place where they feel welcomed. And how does that look like? Uh, you get to know them, you get to know their, the names of their families, their kids, their pets. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot, and believe me, it's taken me um, many years because I am a devout introvert. So I am just head to my computer, doing weeding, collection development, etc. But it does not take a whole lot to just kind of extend yourself and just ask how they're doing. Um, it could take a minute or two, but you then allow people to feel a little bit better uh, because of your presence and they'll continue um, uh, coming to your um, library, and of course, you'll build a relationship. You'll see kids just uh, grow up before your eyes um, in the library, and I just think that that's a, a really uh, invaluable thing for us to do in the lesson. Thank you very much.
So Shima and I are going to completely merge our presentations. I think she's getting her notes right now, so I'm just going to stall for a moment. Uh, I'm Joe Stoner, the Newark Library Manager, part of Alameda County Library. And we didn't know each other before this presentation, but we discovered we're kind of doing very parallel things, so. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Um, our presentation is on Promotoras at the Library and Beyond. This photo is members of our promotoras from 23-24 fiscal year, the Mission Branch staff and our Mobile Outreach Services staff, all ready to march or be part of the Carnaval Parade in May 2024. So as Joe shared. I'll, I'll just add that I've been the manager at Newark for seven and a half years after I moved to the Bay Area from Las Vegas. And um, my name's Shima Avalos. I'm the Adult Services Manager at the Mission Branch Library here at SFPL. I've been in this role for about 14 months. So why would two people who don't know each other present together at a conference? Um, <laughs> we saw, when we saw the panel proposal that we both had promotoras in our program, or. Um, discussion and we wanted to talk to each other to see what similarities we had and we realized that we had one problem which was outreach to Spanish speakers and we had two related but different models we thought it would be useful to show different approaches to better serving Spanish speaking patrons so you see here we have a list of the differences Alameda County had an English speaking librarian SFPL had a bilingual English and Spanish speaking librarian myself and some of the mission staff were involved as well as other libraries staff. Alameda County had no additional library monies at first, although there was later a grant. Ours started with funding through a grant. Alameda County, again, was started by one staff member. SFPL had top-down support. Um, it came from management, the grant. And Alameda County's program was focused on one branch. SFPL was focused on various branches. Alameda County had a little bit more of an informal approach, and SFPL had a pretty formal approach. We had an MOU. Alameda County's um, program has been going on for approximately five years, and SFPL is just about to start their second year. The majority of our work took place for about eight months during the last fiscal year. So when we're talking about the, the problem or the need, to me, it just came from a general observation in my first year on the job that we weren't seeing a proportional number of Spanish speakers or, or Latino families in the library compared to the numbers in the community. And I just, I pulled this from the California school dashboard where we see over half of the Newark Unified students are Hispanic or Latino. And there was several things that went into the um, background of our Promotoras program. One very specific thing that we were noticing as we were coming back from the COVID closures was that SFPL already has a very well-established scholar card program. We automatically register all our public library students for library cards. All our students who come in have library cards available to them. We were noticing that our Spanish-speaking parents were bringing their students into the library. The students were checking out books. They were making use of our third space, really valuable to our community that way. We were also noticing that the parents weren't going into the adult section. They weren't making themselves library cards, and they weren't getting access to information about the resources that would be available to them. So that highlighted a specific group that we really wanted to reach out to. So you might be wondering, what is a promotora? And I want to tell you just a little bit about what it means in Newark. Um, the promotora model has been around at least since the 1960s throughout Latin America, and, and there's similar programs all around the world, honestly. It's, it's a model of training lay people, so people who are not health professionals, to provide health education and very basic health care. I would say from our experience in the Bay Area and I think in the United States that it, it's kind of morphed in, in recent decades into more of a social service model. There is an organization, Vision y Compromiso, that puts on conferences and provides other support to, to local promotoras. 
This is a photo of a, a Promotora graduation in Newark. So in the time that I've been working with the network, I think they've had three cohorts. It's a 72-hour, eight-week leadership training. So it, it's a pretty big time commi commitment and pretty intensive. The library has not been involved in this, this training at all. This is just something that they organize and put on for themselves. Um, what I, one of the things I really enjoy about the model is a lot of it is based on the work of uh, the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, author of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So his, his work was, a lot of it was in literacy and, and community education and really about uplifting people who had little formal education. So Paulo Freire critiques what he, he sees as the traditional model of education as the banking model, where the teacher is the one who is assumed to have all the answers and the teacher is just depositing knowledge into the students' heads. This whole model, uh, Freire's model and the whole Promotora model is, is turning this upside down. It's, it's empowering anyone, no matter what their educational background is, that they can be a change maker in the community. Um, so for some background on the beginnings of the SFPL Promotoras program, the grant for SFPL Promotoras was written by our then Director of Communications, Kate Patterson, during the last fiscal year. It encompassed various communities, including San Francisco's black community, Arabic-speaking communities, and Spanish-speaking communities. I can really only speak to my experience with the part of the program that was focused on Spanish-speaking parents of public schools students. This pilot was focused on making use of community knowledge as well. And at the point where I came onto the project, mission graduates had already been reached out to as the source of our Spanish-speaking promotoras. Mission Graduates is a well-established organization focused on making college the expectation rather than the exception for SF students, youth, and families. And they do so through a wide range of after-school, in-school, and summer programs. They call it creating a college-going culture. Once the grant was finalized, we gave mission graduate a menu of sorts that they could then um, pick through to see what they would be able to provide for the amount that we could pay. From there, mission graduates selected the promotoras who would participate in the SFPL promotoras pilot. So what did the pilot look like? The pilot started in October 2023 and went through May 2024. Our goal was to have the promotoras reach out to the schools they were already working with. So the promotoras were trained to give an introduction to the library presentation to parents at public schools they were already assigned to. Promotoras walked parents after the presentation to the public library nearest their school, which wasn't necessarily the mission branch, and it wasn't necessarily a branch that had Spanish speakers who worked there. That's why they worked with me, who was their coordinator, to ensure that there was a Spanish-speaking librarian there that day to give the parents a tour of the library, to highlight where the Spanish language collections were, to show them exactly where the return and the checkout areas were. The idea behind that was to make them feel comfortable enough that they would be able to navigate the space, even if they didn't feel comfortable, to ask for help in Spanish, which is their right under our language ordinance. Um, Overall, we gave 10 presentations and seven librarian-led tours total. So it was really successful. And every time we signed up parents for their library cards, a lot of times we were able to um, troubleshoot problems that they had had with their children's accounts and really help them feel welcome and eager to come back to the library. So I've, I've got this big list of programs that we have offered at the library uh, as a result of the, the relationships that we built. I want to give a, a shout out to uh, one of our former staff as of last Saturday, Francisco Ramirez. He is now working for San Mateo County Library. You can find him at the Millbay branch. Um, but really, most of these programs you know, were developed through conversations with people, with community members, finding out like, what are, what are your needs? What can we do to help support you? And um, it's, just, it's just been, I mean, 
I should say, like all of these together probably re represent at least 200 individual sessions. And the level of dedication we have, we have 20 plus adults showing up to you know, a Spanish language program, as you see, our, our weekly program. This is kind of the core that holds everything together is our Manitas en Acción, or Little Hands in Action program. It draws 50 to 75 children and adults every week. And it's interesting because it's been going for five years now. Like we have totally new families involved now than at the beginning. Um, this was started originally by two volunteers. Actually, the woman in the front there, Lorena, was one of the original volunteers. And then the library was able to hire her and some other women uh, as library performers to lead the program. But uh, it's, it's really, it, it's modeled kind of loosely on a story time. We have the children take turns reading in Spanish and then there's some kind of an activity afterwards. But I, I really think it's all about community building. That, that's really what keeps people coming back. Um, another program that the library did not create but we are supporting is an adult Spanish language book club. This meets at the recreation center they're now on their fourth book. They've been reading Spanish language self-help books, usually a couple chapters a month. And they're up to almost 40 members, which I find just incredible. And I, I tell them I've never seen an English language book club with those kinds of numbers. But you can see how dedicated they are. And we are buying copies of the books for them uh, as gifts, so they all have their own copies. This is one of the most powerful things that I think has come out of this. And there were a couple of women in the community who've actually been professional actors in Latin America. And they were doing kind of a, an art-inspired mental health series. And, and for their capstone or their, the culmination, they wrote and practiced and presented this theater uh, performance that was was all about telling some some snippets of their life story, and we had a packed house. We had a hundred people there. I, I think what was so inspiring to me was that for most of these women who were who were doing the acting, this is the very first time in their lives they had ever done any acting, and it was just it was just jaw dropping, amazing. So I want to talk about. In this context, what does outreach look like for us? I mean, some of it is, you know, kind of more traditional models. We, we do set up an information table sometimes. This was at the Promotora's annual picnic in a park. But what I like to think of more of what we do is just showing up and being part of the festivities. So you can see me there playing trombone. <laughs> um, to some uh, Los Angeles Azules. Um, there's some dancing going. We brought out our, our library PA so we could play music and make announcements. Um, this wasn't at the event I was remembering, but they also have a, an annual holiday party where I took some of the library musical instruments. Again, it's just showing up and being present and showing the community you know, some of the surprising ways you know, the library is doing programming these days. It's, we're, we're doing some new things here. And just to really highlight that SFPL, I'll share in a second, but despite the differences in our programs, we really have the same takeaways. Outreach is showing up. So for me, it was really important when we started this program that we get the promotoras involved in being part of the Carnaval Parade. Mission Branch used to participate more than a decade ago, and it was really important for me to have us be a presence there and to let our community know that we were part of that community in this really joyous way. So this is one of our pages, Jonathan waving. This is during the parade, we're in the middle, we are blowing bubbles, we are giving out stickers, and we walk the whole parade behind the bookmobile. So speaking of shared takeaways, um, what did we learn, what have we learned? And it is really interesting, I can't emphasize enough how much our takeaways were basically exactly the same. Mass marketing strategies are not going to reach communities with specific needs. 
Telling people to go to the website is not going to be helpful if your website is not easy to navigate if you are not a native English speaker. It's not going to be helpful if you live in a neighborhood that has demonstrated Wi-Fi issues. Examples, the community already knows how to communicate with each other. Joe's had a lot of success with WhatsApp. It's been really, really amazing. Um, and it works really well with strategies that the library is already using. The WhatsApp group shares posters that would be created normally. They're just being shared in a different way. And I'll circle back to that in a minute. Can, can I chime in for a second? Yeah. So I mean, I think in Newark, so Shima's partnership was with a formal nonprofit, Mission Graduates. And in Newark, I view the promotoras really as this informal network connected through dozens of WhatsApp groups. They, at the last time they attempted to count, there were over 600 people involved. And one of our library staff is also a promotora, so she's really connected. And like Shima was saying, we're, we're sharing flyers there that we would have created anyway, but not expecting people to come to the website. Also, there's a huge amount of power in acknowledging that you're not serving certain communities only if you take the next step to do something about it. We tell everybody that the library is for everyone and everybody is welcome, but we have to be really honest with ourselves about who's not coming in. It doesn't have to come from a place of shame. It can come from a place of opportunity. Think of the discussions your youth services librarians have regarding teens, which is a demonstrated community that we know we're not reaching as much as we'd like. What does that look like when you turn that lens on other language need communities or differently abled needed communities or people who have different information needs for any other number of reason but are still very much part of your community. Also very important, the community knows how to help itself. The only way you're going to make inroads into a community is to acknowledge the strength and power that they have and acknowledge how they've been making up for our lack of reaching out to them. And I think the WhatsApp group really speaks to it, the promotoras really speak to it. We've seen a lot of these coalitions here in San Francisco be built during the COVID pandemic closures. For instance, the Latino Task Force, which really came in out of a vacuum of reaching out to our Spanish speaking and Latinx community. Can I add one thing too, Shima? So you and, you and I were talking about how it's, it's kind of the bottom-up approach that once, once you do start building these meaningful relationships, like that's really how the word of mouth marketing grows. We, we have a core of really dedicated promotoras in the library, and I know because they tell me that they're constantly telling other people, like, you should go to the library for that. Did you know the library offers that? Yeah, um, there's also part of this is the equity model, and I think Joe can speak to that. But, but this, I was just thinking about how, for some of our, our really popular programs in the library, so when we've offered coding or any kind of STEM-related workshop or even our homework help, and, and we're relying on the library website or online registration, we do see that families who aren't as well connected will get crowded out. Like, if we're doing online registration, all of the seats are taken by people who have the time and financial resources to be able to, to register online or who know how to you know, code a bot that's gonna register for them. So we know that's happening. And just a reminder, it can seem really overwhelming. It can seem like a way to kind of spiral into focusing on what you're not doing or thinking that you might have to reinvent the wheel, but it's just more of what we've been doing. It's just outreach, just in a more focused and meaningful way. It's programs in a focused and meaningful way. This is the bread and butter of our profession. It's just making sure we put it where people can actually get it. Um, and that's our contact info. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any questions. We're going to do questions for all three presentations after the third one. Okay, okay everyone. 
All right, my name is Richard Lee. I'm the uh, branch manager of the North Beach Library. And today I'm gonna show you or share with you a very different approach to doing things and doing outreach and then bringing the community back to the library. Before I start, I wanna ask you guys one, a few questions. How many of you have been to San Francisco Chinatown? Okay, how many have Chinese food before? <laughs> Do you know the origin of the Chinese food? Certain, you know, dim sum or something like that? No? All right, good. Okay, and how many of you have started doing your family history research? Uh, <laughs> why, why, how come you're not, you guys are not doing it? <laughs> because is it too hard? Not for you, right? Or something else, or just lazy, <laughs> right? But the talk today, I'm gonna make it fun, okay? I'm gonna make it fun and encourage all of you. And I hope to see maybe 80% of you come back and because we're gonna have a conference later on um, next month, okay? So hopefully this talk will inspire you to get into that or, or to try some of the new approach when you go home back to your library and do something else, adapt it, you know, okay. Are you guys ready? <laughs> All right, so I just wanna share with you um, how I turn a typical genealogy family research class into a fun, you know, community buildings, engaging activity for all people. Okay. And so, so I got started um, doing genealogy when I first um, worked in a library. I was helping a elderly person uh, in his 70s. The reason I want to share the story is that I want to show you or share with you how meaningful it is to, as a librarian to help people to find people. I know it's kind of spooky, right? But that's our job, provide information, okay? So 2008, a patron came to the library and asked me, sitting at the reference desk, wanting to locate the phone number of his lost college roommate 40 years ago. And this person was is in his 70s. Couldn't tell me where this person, this person who he's looking for, where he is right now, what his name, full name, no name, no locations. Now, as you know, if you do genealogy, location, location, location. If you can tell me the location, I can track you down. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, so, no location, no name, no age, okay? So basically, he's thinking about this roommate that he only met or, or stayed together one year in a freshman year in Brigham Young University. He came to me and said, Richard, I need you to find this person for me. And I, sure. And I said, okay, start from your university, Brigham Young University. Look at that yearbook. Okay, go through all that yearbooks, and he was able to find the photographs of this person. And from the photographs, I do several steps, finding it, his major, college majors, and graduation date. And sure enough, this person donated money back to the university, and that's how I tracked them. <laughs> and to make the story short, I was able to find this person in 30 minutes using professional website like the American, American Library Association, you know, a certain professional website this person's in, able to find the um, voters' registration records um, using modern-day Google search. Basically, the entire experience was really rewarding, and that's how it got me to start doing GIG, okay? And I want to inspire you to do the same thing, too. And so, throughout my time, I started doing teaching classes uh, starting 2010, about 12 years ago. And ever since, I've been helping people to locate um, biological child, parents, lost childhood friends, or maybe your favorite teachers in elementary, 
you want to or property research to see whether your house is built under certain you know landslide or whatever. And then also to help you to find your ancestor oversee, oversee. And then also from a picture, you can find out, oh, I had less time. Okay, from a picture, you can find out about um, who's in the picture, military record, and so forth. But what I want to really to show you or share with you that there's benefits of doing genealogy. And those are on the, the board. Basically, as we do, search our past or research our ancestor, we become, we learn a little bit about ourselves, And it gives you a deeper meaning of what our value, cultures, and so on. And we also understand their life challenges and triumphs. And we be, soon we develop a sense of purpose in life, in our life, okay? And also we start to connect with the people who we're doing research and as we develop the compassions and sympathies towards to that person. And in the long run, and if you do, um, if you have a group together, you start to develop, you start to connect with those people who you work with, just like librarian and patrons and so forth. And so it's really, really rewarding in a sense. So this is what I did. This is a different approach. So I take an ordinary genealogy class, kind of boring, right? because no one want to learn about database and, and newspaper, okay? So instead of doing that, I'll take them to a walking tour. I say, meet outside the library. Let's go to Chinatown. And then along the tour, I'll introduce like Chinese food, dim sum, and I'll tell them the original of dim sum and how you know, people were there. You know, when we walked through the secret alley of Chinatown, I'll tell them about ghost stories and what was that building, who was there, and so forth, as they become interested in the history of certain neighborhoods or ethnic group, they become hooked on the information. And that's when I bring them back to the library. <laughs> And so the goal is to con really, really, really to build a program that connect people to our service, okay, beyond, outside the library, both in and out the library. If it doesn't work inside, do it outside. Create activity that cater to their needs. In this case, food tour. People love to eat, okay? And people love to share their recipe. And people love to share their experience. And again, you're fostering that connections, the really connection that you need to build a community. And then what you're essentially doing is you're creating a meaningful experience. And that is very important. It's not what you give to them, like database and resources. It's how you give it. And the way how you give it is make it meaningful, make it more purposeful. And then, you know, as people doing it, they have a chance to meet other people, socialize with other people, and they'll become more appreciative of what we do as a librarian and what we can offer as a librarian. And that's the message I want to share with you. And so typically, traditional library classroom, you have a very structured top-down communication and we find confined in space. Whereas this approach is learning outside do some storytelling and have create some activities. And then you will foster that social connectiveness or self explorations and so on. And so this is what I did. I take Tifu to Chinatown every month. And you guys can join too. Okay, I, I do this every month. It's about an hour long, an hour to two hour long, walking distance to um, maybe a mile or so. I'll take you to different secret alley. Uh, um, and then tell you what's going on, you know, of San Francisco, China. Not just Chinatown, I also do the North Beach tour. For those of you who are interested, uh, learning about the Italian communities and so forth. So it's really interesting. So this is me doing a tour, showing people historic Chinatown. And these are, as you can see, there are a lot of different, you know, groups and age. Um, and then this is me on top of a building overlooking North Beach. And this is a secret place when you, the 
the flying angels, what is that? The blue angel is coming, and this is the place to go and see. And so the story of the recipe, the secret recipe is add food and storytelling to make it fun. And then what we do is bring it back to a library. And last year, we did a conference in May where the whole auditorium was packed in here. And then they're learning genealogy. Isn't that great? And so the success is that if you have happy patrons and if you can provide a sense of community that equal stronger library support. And the success of this meeting basically create a meaningful um, experience. And so here's the next genealogy conference for those of you who want to join me. And of course, you're invited for a, a walking tour afterward. Now, so this is the virtual. It's gonna happen October 23rd here. Um, and then these are the people that I have invited to give a talk, basically sharing resources. So we have the um, National Archive coming, Sonoma County History and Genealogy Society. Uh, we, genealogy for um, the African, San Francisco African Americans, Historic and Cultural Society and so forth. And that's all I have today. Thank you. Okay, we left a lot of time for questions. So if I know um, some of that was sped through, if there's anything that you want the presenters to talk about more in depth, this is your chance to ask. Hi, I just had a question going back to the data. Can you share a little bit of the different sources of data you use to gather the metrics to figure out which communities are perhaps not being served? For the promotoras? Uh, for any of you. Um, well, San Francisco Public Library has recently moved to a very data-driven approach um, following the pandemic reopenings. We started getting access to our census data collated in a way that was measured across our um, service areas based on library in each neighborhood. So that's something that the branch managers have access to and have been encouraged to use. That's definitely something that was getting used when the grant was being created. I know that when the grant was being written to, the management and management team was very mindful of the sort of different levels of participation in our summer reading programs and how they differentiated very strongly across um, ethnic and racial lines and language access lines. So I think that was something that was of a big, um, a big inspiration to us at SFPL. And then just experientially, um, my branch, the mission branch, most of our staff is on a Spanish language requisition. And just from our experience with the patrons that we dealt with, that was a way we were able to highlight it. Can I add a quick thought? So I think several of us have English conversation groups going. And to me, that's kind of the magical thing of how you can identify what needs or you're not serving. So in my library, we recently started several Arabic language programs and Russian that all came out of interest expressed in the conversation groups. Just start talking, that's just me. Um, I have a question for uh, Richard. It's about your uh, genealogy and walking tour thing. Did you, did you speak with the, um, I guess, restaurant uh, owners or whoever you go to bring people through Chinatown and incorporate that into like your presentation in the full physical format and just, it's just a fascinating, um, program to me. I, it's just amazing. So All of it. <laughs> yeah. So as you take, you know, a group of 20 or 30 people to Chinatown and people look, and it's, it's very natural to go in different shops. Like, for example, I don't know if you heard the uh, uh, Fortune Cookie Factory. Oh, you should try that place. I mean, like, so the owner would usually come out and then I would uh, ask for samples and they would give us samples. Uh, so, but for me, if I have money on my budget, programming money, so I can occasionally can afford uh, maybe a hundred dollar dim sum, 
which is not a lot, you know, for maybe like 25 people, uh, a couple pieces for each person, and, and depending how you want to build it, uh, it, it would be nice to get like a sponsor or, or uh, food or something, but in, in most of the time, I think people who come to the, the tour or the class, they're really generous too. I mean, like they're not, as, they, they will pay for it, you know. So it's really about community, uh, about, you know, learnings and, and building that trust and, and, and so forth. So it's really fun. I don't see it as a work. <laughs> I just take people to places. <laughs> So kind of in line with the theme of this panel, I imagine that a program like this would have very wide appeal for people. So is there a mechanism in place for folks who maybe English is not their first language but is interested in learning about these these kind of historical points Yeah, of so I have, I have um, um, Chinese speaking or Cantonese, and then I have like uh, ABC, American born Chinese, and also uh, Italians. Uh, uh, so different uh, language, you know, people speak different language, but once you get them into like a food tour, you know, serving food, and they all speak the same language. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, they have shared stories, and they say, oh, this is what happened to my grandmother, or whatever. And then they say, yeah, me too. And then so you don't really, so the point I want to make is that um, you want to create a program or activities that encompass or, or inviting all these cultural differences. And as a group, food will bring everyone together. Hi, my name is Meher, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about using WhatsApp. How do you use that? And I mean, I like the idea a lot about promoting events and sending, you know, we do social media, I do Facebook and I do next door, but I'd love to be able to use WhatsApp. So can you tell me a little bit about that? I'm not the expert, but I will tell you there are some risks relative to how we normally do social media in the library. So WhatsApp does have to be tied to a phone number and we've researched and tried to figure out how to do it as an institution and really haven't quite figured that out yet. So we have a staff member who's really connected, and so she's posting from her own account. That, that's how it's been working. And she, she's very comfortable. She's very well known in the community, has a huge amount of trust. So that, that's how it's worked for us. It is possible, or it was um, several years ago, to do WhatsApp for business, and you still do need to start it with a mobile number, but you can connect it to a verified computer, a desktop computer. So if you link it to someone's account, um, if you were able to do something, it doesn't work with Google Voice, which is usually the workaround for some kind of privacy, but if there is an ability to do that through maybe an emergency phone, or I don't know if you have an outreach department, and maybe they have a phone that's able to be activated just for that purpose. No questions? Um, I have a question for Richard. I know that there's a genealogy um, research that can be done, but it requires some knowledge of Chinese, and it's a different kind of genealogy than normally would be used by Americans. Thank you, Sima. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, at the library, we just currently subscribe to a, a database very similar to Ancestry Library Edition. It's called My China Root. Basically, learning, uh, basically a database uh, researching Chinese or or Asians' roots. Um, basic, it's, in the, it's a company that gather aggregated uh, records, family records from um, China or in the A Southeast Asian regions. Not just include China, but also in Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and, and, and also some Latin American country where, um, where Chinese ethnic or yeah. So it's really interesting database.
question for all the panelists. Um, we've heard what you've been doing. I would love to know. I'd love to know. Ah, <laughs> I'd love to know what you're planning. If you have any sort of the the, the sort of your wish file or uh, actual direction somewhere that you haven't mentioned. So programs, um, dreams that you have, something else, the next step that you might take for any of the programs. I'm still thinking. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you should. You should. Um, well, I'm really looking forward to the grant getting approved for this next year. We have a great model in place, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, as far as programming in our location, I'm in a temporary site because our historic Carnegie Library is undergoing a renovation. So I'm looking forward to when we're able to host programs at the renovated mission site. I think in Alameda County, my, my long-term dream has been to see how other libraries could try to replicate what we've done. And I know it is challenging because we have this kind of unique relationship with this, this local network, but I know that the Promotoras network has expanded, I know, I know this for a fact, it's, it's expanded beyond the city of Newark, so I think there is an opportunity there. One of the things I did this year was to invite as many of the library administration and staff from other branches to that annual picnic, so at least they got to meet each other in person. Um, that's what my long-term dream is. I thought of something. Um, <laughs> so the um, mobile park home that we visit, that's a program that just uh, basically uh, we just started. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because the latest that we can um, go is about five o'clock because it's on a Friday and we close at six o'clock. Um, only problem is some of the children that we might be able to reach from there have not yet come home from the after school programs that they stay at while their parents work and then pick them up. Um, there are some children who are um, homeschooled and so we try to bring activities and books and whatever it is we can. Uh, but the other thing is, you'd be really surprised how a big, you know, a bookmobile, um, music, and people setting up doesn't kind of, not that it won't wake people up, but it, it won't attract them unless you kind of go door to door. And you have to be a little careful with that because um, there's one particular park that has a couple of really protective German shepherds, mm. and so not messing with that, you know. Um, you, and you go anywhere close, and they'll start up, et cetera. So I would like to do more door-to-door -door announcing our services, announcing our presence, playing music, et cetera, but I want to be respectful of them and their time, but yeah, that's something I definitely like to see grow a little bit more. So I guess for me is my goal is just want to introduce genealogy family history research to all different age group, not just for you know certain age, um, even the little kid, because there's a, a very fascinating way to engage the kid or even teenager. I used to be a teen librarian when I go to the school, I would say, oh, don't talk about whatever, you know, database and resources. Let's see if your teacher, if I can find your teacher's uh, yearbook pictures when she was like <laughs> your age. So that's what I get the crowd excited about. And then I'll start teaching database or, or, or homework help or, yeah. So that's my goal is to perhaps create some things or programs that really encourage or really get people to start doing genealogy because look at all those benefits I shared with you uh, earlier about, you know, uh, developing the empathy, understanding, compassion, and so forth. Those are the kind of things that we need today. Hi. <laughs> Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but really just um, 
a moment of appreciation for what you're doing and for illuminating these ideas for us, um, for exemplifying how you can actually get out and go to different spaces and address people by meeting them where they're at. Um, for instance, in the mobile, um, the, the housing sites um, in Mountain View or actually participating in a parade to create visibility and spark interest in getting people to come into your branch. Um, the genealogy I'm really interested in because of the community that I particularly serve. There's a lot of opportunities um, and just like not necessarily, sometimes looking at outreach you can be like, oh, how am I gonna, <laughs> How am I going to do this? And who is there? And where are these people? And da da da. But like the 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 creativity that you've all um, shared with us is super inspiring and really um, kind of sparks value in and reminds us of the work that we do. So thank you very much for all that you've shared and mad respect and appreciation. Thank you. This is a question for Richard. I had two oh, no. questions, kind of. Um, one, will you ever give us a training on how to find people like that, like you do? Um, like maybe at another conference, or if you ever hold a virtual one, will you ever show us how to do that? Sure. <laughs> you see how I got her to hook on genealogy? <laughs> I didn't even tell her how hard it is, right? Um, but, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's. You learn, you know, doing that by actually doing it. Uh, no one can really tell you exactly what method to use or how to do it. It's w one of those things that you have to put into it and, and actually practice, uh, because each unique, each person come to you for your for their help is very different and unique, different background, different period of time, different you know circumstances and so forth. So. That's why it's so rewarding in a sense if I'm helping people, each one of them offer me something to learn. I gain not only their personal history or their family, but I learned the technique how to find those information that they're looking for. So to answer your question is, yes, I'll show you, but eventually you have to learn it yourself. The more years or experience you put in, the more, uh, the faster you're gonna find that. Um, so I'm doing an AI right now. I'm using AI to do genealogy. So it's a really exciting time. Okay. Using AI in, okay, in a, as a tool, not to get the answer, but it's faster result. <laughs> and then the second part was, um, when you do your tours, where do you do your research for like the local history? Library. <laughs> <laughs> So we have upstairs, we have the San Francisco history uh, room, and I'm sure, you know, where you work, there is always a genealogical society or history centers. That's how you get your information. And of course, the most important part about uh, doing the tour, it's knowing your neighborhood. And what else better or find that information is actually going to that neighborhood. Talk to the people, talk to the owner of the shops, and they'll tell you story. And then you come back and you go up to your history center and do your research. So basically you're relying on people to tell you their stories. All right, thank you so much. So we... <laughs> We are gonna take a break and we'll meet you back here at 2.45, thank you. <laughs> All right, welcome back everybody. Thanks for coming back. Our next uh, panel is Sustainability Programs and Projects, moderated by Jody Jersa. We've got Carla Avitabile, from uh, Adult <laughs> Services Librarian with San Mateo Public Library, 
Shaughnessy Dunkley, Supervising Librarian of Adult Services with Sunnyvale Public Library. And Albert Garcia, Community Library Manager with Contra Costa County Library. So I want to thank Shaughnessy for stepping in, because we had a panelist who um, couldn't make it. And, um, oh. and I really appreciate it. And I think it's an example of how we meet our challenges. And, like, <laughs> and also the, all the things that happened today. We, you know, we can't predict what's going to happen. And as librarians, we're so used to stepping up and pivoting and, and meeting each challenge. And I think the big, many people, if you look at like all of the like different um, polling out there, is like sustainability and climate change is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges facing us right now. And I believe that libraries, we are in a unique position to help solve that problem or help guide our communities together with our communities to reach those. And so all the different, the different libraries represented here have some overlapping approaches, but some other approaches. So we're hoping to give you some tools going forward for you to help lead the charge against climate change in your library. So I thought we could just go start with what was the origin of your particular sustainability program? Are you okay with going Absolutely. first? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I'm with Sunnyvale Public Library, and we are a one-branch city system. We just broke ground on our first branch um, about a month ago. And so that will be coming up theoretically in 18 months, but everyone knows how construction projects go. Um, this was originally um, supported, um, we had two grants, one from PLP, shout out PLP, thank you so much, um, for money for things inside the home for Library of Things. And then the other one we had was from this LSTA sustainability grant, which we looked at things for outside the home. So um, we started with the Library of Things, but we also had a lot of um, support from our partners, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, Carla Avitable from the City of San Mateo Public Library, and um, I. The origin of our grant is the, you know, one of those emails that we all get, but maybe never read was, kind of. It had one of those like, please, please, somebody apply for the sustainability <laughs> grant. And um, it, uh, one of the librarians I work with wanted to do a seed library and I just have a general interest in sustainability. And um, so we applied for the grant and we got the California sustainability grant. And I, I would also like to say that the sustainability, they paint that with a very broad brush. But some of the things that we all have in common in our projects is that we, try to make, um, create new relationships um, as an important part of what we did with our sustainability. And also, um, we all had some form of workshops as well. So, on to you, Albert. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Albert Garcia, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian with Contra Costa County. And um, I don't really have a starting point like a grant, but um, what we did is, is really just trying to take a couple of things um, that are important to our communities, revolved around sustainability, uh, a couple of things I'll talk about today is our seed libraries, um, which I think have been really successful, uh, and some of the things that are in our Library of Things collection, uh, as well as some of the partnerships that we have created with some county departments and local organizations. So a lot of it is more organic on our end, um, taking some things that we already had um, and trying to uh, create some kind of sustainability kits and programming around some partnerships. So I'll be talking about some of the things that have really worked well for us and some of the challenges that we've, um, uh, that we've been you know, that we've seen with trying to put some of these things together. Okay, I think we one of the things that we really wanted to get into is partnerships, and I'm sure it's something that you all are interested in, since that was kind of some of the exciting different things that we learned from the last um, panel. So um, did you want to get started with talking about some of your partnerships? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Um, one thing that I cannot emphasize enough is for you guys to make friends with your environmental services department. If you are a county or city library, make friends with them, they will give you money. <laughs> um, I, that, that is a very, very silly way of saying that um, we have uh, really started, we, we started a couple years ago with the lending of induction cooktops, which were first uh, brought to us by our um, ESD, our, our Environmental Services Division. And they, um, we started with that and then 
we started, we got the grants, and then we, we, we um, put an Earth Day together with them. Um, but what is, what we did with, through that process is we made our partnerships so strong that I was able to insinuate ourselves into the Climate Action Playbook. Um, I don't know, do, you, do your cities have Climate Action Playbooks? So I was able to get some, um, some points in there saying that the library will provide education on sustainability and climate change, and that the library would be able to provide support for various environmental services. Um, with the new branch, one thing that was really exceptional that we were able to have with the, with the help of our partners at ESD is we had a $500,000 grant um, to electrify the building. Um, that also paid for environmental speakers um, and got, got the library connected with some of the utilities in the area so that we could have them as speakers just on our own. Um, the Sunnyvale City Hall was just recently had their grand opening and they are a net zero library and we are going to the, um, I'm sorry, not necessarily, they're, they're a net zero lead platinum city hall, and we are going to the voters in November for a, potentially a bond for a new library, which is also meant to be lead platinum and um, net zero. So I guess what I would say is when you make friends with your ESD folks, let them know what you can do to support their needs. Um, with the Climate Action Playbook, one other thing we were able to do, and you may have seen this floating across your dashboards, we were able to, um, to get a sustainability librarian position. It's a full-time position for two years. It is funded by ESD. It is not coming out of the library budget. And I am so excited to bring them on board. We're getting hiring interviews um, in the next week or so. And I already have a list of things I want them to help me with. Um, one of them being the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. Um, I'd love to get certification for that. So that's just to start with your ESD folks. Um, I just want to second that. Like any, you might not even need a grant or maybe you don't even have that much money, but usually your sustainability office or your county of sustainability or public works, public works, public works. <laughs> <laughs> tend to have, well, public works, at least in the city of San Mateo, and I would almost guarantee in every jurisdiction in the state of California is dealing with something that we have a lot of, and that's solid waste, um, which in the Bay Area a lot of times is um, even the distribution of the green waste compost. Um, and also they, so I work with Public Works Solid Waste Division, and they have their own grants and their own money, and so they've helped fund or pay for things. So now that, I, I mean, going forward, I'm still doing projects, and you know, they've kicked in the cash for that, and the sustainability of the city of San Mateo is also paid for programming. So those are things that didn't have to come out of our budget. And also something that I kind of like is, I don't, I feel like, awesome, we kick-started these things, but I don't, need to feel like, well, that's my project. Like, I own that project. I'm like, now you own that project. Keep doing it so I can do something else I want to do. Yay. Um, so I found that definitely if you reach out to Public Works, Solid Waste especially, and also any kind of sustainability or environmental portion of your county or city, it's likely that they have money and they'll be happy to talk to you because they don't always have a good idea of what to do. And as libra libraries, we have a reach that they don't have, right? Because we have usually library newsletters and other ways we communicate with uh, you know, parents who go to story time might not be reading the city newsletter, but they're probably reading the library newsletter. So we help them, they help us, and it's, it really takes a lot of pressure off our day-to-day -day things that we need to do all the time and then have this additional like big project we want to work on, so. Yeah, I'm gonna jump off right off of what Carla was talking about because we do um, have a lot of partnerships that work for us really well um, when it comes to programming or getting the information out on different resources and it's been, 
It's worked out really well for us because a lot of the local organizations and county departments will reach out to us and say, hey, we have this service that's coming up. We have this resource and we're trying to get the word out. We want to do a program. That's our, our big partnership is doing um, programs. And obviously, since we've moved past uh, after the pandemic into virtual programming, we're able to do a lot of great virtual programming with them, um, which has helped because in person is difficult to get people in attendance. And we're able to record our recording, our, our programs and post them to our YouTube channel. So. A lot of our partners have come that way where I get an email or a phone call or someone says, hey, someone mentioned this, they're interested in doing this, and, um, and, and we've got a nice template for that. So our virtual programs, you know, we've got our program and our publicity, we're able to get the events page, we use our Zoom, and so we've been able to do that. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, though, is, is allowing yourself to prepare for um, limiting yourself uh, in a way, because we love to say yes. You know, when I first started this job, I think um, three years ago, um, I was approached by Sustainable Walnut Creek. They had a, um, a sustainability week that they wanted to do some programs and they wanted to have us host them on Zoom. And they said, we have six programs we want to do, four on Monday, through, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and two on Friday. And I said, yeah, that's great. You know, that's, <laughs> like I said, I was new. I wanted to say yes. I wanted to, to, to do these things. And we, we, at the core, it's what we want to do. Um, but um, it, it was a bad idea. <laughs> the programs were great. You know, we had electric vehicles, electrification, home, electri uh, vacation for your home, things like that. But I would encourage you to create some kind of game plan, have a template, have a little elevator speech to say, you know, that's a wonderful idea, but how about we do two or three programs instead of six? Or how about we spread them out a little bit more? Um, I think what we, what we want to do, and one of the things I do in my job is saying yes to these organizations, but how do we make it so that we're not overburdening ourselves and our staff? And so um, we've had some great partnerships, and, and some of them that I want to mention, um, like our Master Gardener partnership, um, before pandemic we were doing in person, but since then we've been doing almost a monthly program with them. We get hundreds of people in attendance for these. They're very successful. And those are the kind of programs that are sustainable. Um, but uh, I think it's important to at least help yourself. And, I, and one of the things that I keep hearing that we're working with a lot of library systems are doing are creating a, a programming framework and this allows us to focus our programming on what our library systems are trying to do with our objectives and our goals, but it also puts in some information to say, it's okay to say no, it's okay to say that we're just not able to do this, we don't have the staffing, um, we don't have the time, we don't have the capacity to do this. So um, on the one hand, yes, we wanna help, but on the other hand, we wanna make sure that we're not overextending ourselves, and, and um, so I think that's very important to consider when, when entering into these partnerships. Yeah, so one thing I was like thinking about, you brought up the Master Gardeners, are there some other like groups that you guys, besides the city and stuff that you've been like working with that you think are particularly helpful? Uh, yes, a number of them, and, and luckily they've been coming to, to me. <laughs> um, our Water, Our World, we worked with over the last couple of years. I think sometimes programs will get some grant money where they have to go out and do some uh, programming and they reached out to us. They made it really easy. They had about six topics that they were ready to talk about. They, you know, they sent me all the information. You know, as programming has developed, and, and I think we all understand, programming is not just what we used to do is make a flyer and, and open up the space and have a program, but you know, we got graphic work requests now, we're creating our events pages, we're taking statistics, there's all these things that go into it. And so um, you, you get it down into a template that you can do where you're comfortable doing that work, it's been very successful. So Our Water, Our World was a um, partner for our, what we had. We did virtual programs in the middle of an afternoon, maybe 11 midday on a Tuesday, where you're not gonna get huge attendance at that event, but we are, like I said, recording it, and we're getting huge attendance on our, our YouTube channel. And I think that's you know, easier for everybody to, to uh, at least try to attend it. Um, we also, um, I mentioned the Sustainable Walnut Creek. Um, uh, Contra Costa, Sustainable Contra Costa has a great organization called um, Student Leaders in Action, SLEA and they're high school students, and they put on a quarterly program where they get people from the environmental uh, fields to talk about their career path, to encourage others to pursue these kinds of careers. And they've actually made it really easy for us. They create the graphics. We've given them the template of how we want it branded, and they create our graphics. And so I'm, I still host the program, and I'm still there doing it, but um, that's another successful program that we do quarterly. So we have them on the calendar. We know when they're gonna take place, and um, we have a contact that we're working with, and so those have been very successful. We also have been working with the California Native Plant Society. There's also a Beekeepers Guild that are also, those are really good. With the Beekeepers Guild, um, you'll wanna make sure that they're willing to sign a liability waiver if they would like to, um, to come to one of your programs. 
Don't ask me how I know that. Um, we also are working with the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. Um, that's been actually an incredible partnership that we've grown. Um, they are always looking for folks to come and visit their refuge, and we want to send people there. Um, they are willing to give uh, bird watching tours. They're able to do virtual programs for us as well, and it's all free, and um, it's, it's really nice to be able to have that opportunity to work with not just your local folks, but with the federal folks as well. Um, and we also have worked with, I think maybe some of you have also worked with Repair Cafe, and we work with them where they're a mending um, organization that will come and visit us twice a year, and they ask anybody to bring whatever they want, and they will try to make it work, and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything else you want to add, Carla? Um, if on the peninsula, Rethink Waste is a good resource and they will come out and do programs. I know, I believe they did that with Burlingame, but also they just have a lot of great ideas. Like we had a, on, for Earth Day this past year, we had a bunch of different things, but the thing that brought like 40 people to the library was a puzzle swap. <laughs> like those maniacal puzzlers. Um, but Within that group, they want, you know, they finish a puzzle, they, why not swap it? So that, um, but that was an idea from Rethink Waste that we had that they, I think, hosted, or you hosted them at your We had a, over 100 people, and yeah. it was just puzzles. Yeah, it's like bonkers. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's a great resource for the peninsula is Rethink Waste. And... I, we didn't do Repair Cafe, but um, Fix It Clinic is contracted with the Office of Sustainability for the County of San Mateo. So they did, they've done several Fix It Clinics with us, and but their model's a little different where they try to have you fix your own thing with a Fix It coach. Um, you, most things do get fixed unless, I mean, just things you would never think of and people say, well, what did they bring? And it's like, Stuffed animals, quilts, picture frames, blenders, um, vacuum cleaners, uh, CD players, like uh, wireless speakers. Just name something that's broken that you think might be able to get fixed. Somebody brought it to Fix It Clinic, and I know you also have experience with Fix It Clinic. And they're they have a group of volunteers, and it's kind of nice because they're not are volunteers so they don't have to get fingerprinted they don't have to go through volunteer orientation so even if they haven't like had a real orientation with fix it clinic it's not really my problem and i mean there's like <laughs> but they, i mean there's like 75 people in there so you know some of the issues that might surround an adult volunteer is doesn't really matter in that space because there's so many people in that space it's not like they're like fixing something in some back room <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had the Fix-It Clinic too, and I think they're a great partner because they do fit in right into what we're trying to do with our strategic plan, and they do bring their own volunteers. The challenge that we have had is we're such a big county. We're uh, 26 libraries spread across a big space, and finding volunteers in the different areas is tough, but, but it is in our problem. It, Fix-It Clinic has gone out there, and, and they really advertise and get their, um, their coaches to come to those areas. So that has been a challenge, but it's not something that can't be overcome. Um, so one of the other things that has come up is like the library things, which I know we did, there was a panel a couple of years ago about this, but I think now in the, in the light of sustainability and stuff like that, I think it fits very well as well. Uh, yeah, ours has grown. Um, it started off with some Wi-Fi hotspots. We had a, um, one of our librarians did a needs assessment and found that the hotspots were something that our community wanted and needed. We started off with 14 hotspots, and it has now grown to a library of things of over 450 items. Um, with the library of things, um, how many people, how many of your libraries have libraries of things? Awesome. Okay. Um, one of the things that I found was really challenging, um, and you may have expected this as well, is um, figuring out how to catalog things. Um, I don't know where bear-resistant containers go. Uh, my cataloger does, thank goodness. Um, so there's there's that. Um, how many of you guys have hold lists for your library of things? Yeah. 
Um, we had four sewing machines with a hold list of 98 people. Um, I added two more and ha happily that's gone down, but our uh, list for the serger is still at 104. So we just added another one. So now it's a one to 52 ratio, so that's good. <laughs> um, so one of the other challenges, and, and I would love to hear any information or any insight y'all have on this, is um, to decide whether to add more things to the library of things, or to add new things, or to add more things. Um, I hope that makes sense, to, to decrease the hold ratios. So right now we've kind of split the difference. Um, and we're also focusing on electrification. I know that that's a big thing with our folks is to electrify things. So it started with the induction cooktops, but we have electric leaf blowers and, and other things like that, all focused on getting some of the gasoline out of the, out of the air. Um, so we have a library of things at the city of San Mateo, and it's probably the most popular are like the MiFi's, the Chromebooks. I mean, those are almost 100% of the time checked out. And then we have a, we also did a parks thing. So there's a lot of park, you know, hiking poles and so forth. And um, I, people ask all the time if our sewing machines circulate, but they do not. But what we do have is two days a month on the second and fourth Thursday of the month. I have some volunteers and they set up five sewing machines and then they for three hours they are in the one of our community rooms and people come and sew and I would say that on like minimum people that come is about five and maximum is about 10 to 12 and people come just to like quickly hem my pants or some woman came the other day and she's like my sewing machine is broken and she didn't talk to anyone and she just like sewed <laughs> sewed sewed so it's like a wide that I feel like the mending is really popular. I don't know if you offer anything like that. And whenever I offer the sweater mending, um, that is also really popular. So I feel like clothing repair is something that people are a little more interested in. Maybe Bay Area, just because we're, you know, like hyper focused on all the world ending problems. But um, <laughs> the, I mean, anyone wants to fix their favorite item of clothing, whether they care about the environment or they just like that thing. Yeah. Okay, let's talk library of things. So <laughs> I love the library of things. I think they're great. And I'm one of the persons when you, when you go out to a party and someone says, what do you do? I'm a librarian. Well, what do you do these days? And you, you can't stop because we're, we've got so many things that we're adding. Um, I love the fact that we're doing it. I think number one, it hits on this um, fact that we're giving the community something that they need. Um, something they might not have access to and something that's very important. But the other thing I really look at is, is staff impact. And I think that's something that we really have to consider when we're adding these things, especially for a location like our library system like ours. We have 26 libraries. We're really spread. And where are we going to house these things? Where do they live? Our library of things uh, collection is kind of organic. We didn't really sit down and say, we're going to create a library of things. Here's a committee. Let's all get together and do it. Um, the one I want to talk about is our seed library, very successful. I think it's a wonderful program. 16 of our 26 libraries have one. Um, they're volunteer and some staff run, but it's not too heavy on the staff. And we've got garden clubs, Home Depot and Ace Hardware have all given us donations. We've got a lot of volunteer groups, friends and foundations who help out. Um, some of our libraries have some really nice pieces of furniture that they've acquired to, with little drawers for the seeds, and they look really nice and they've done a great job. Um, giving the community what they're looking for and, and less impact on the staff, um, it, it, that one meets. Uh, not all of them meet those, unfortunately. Our second one I want to talk about is our energy efficiency toolkit. Um, came from a partnership with Bayren. It's got a, um, you know, like an infrared thermometer to check some cold spots in your house, something to check, make sure your outlets are working properly, a thermometer for the refrigerator, things that people can use to help make their house more efficient. Um, we got this through a partnership with Bay Ren. We got all these materials and put them in a bag and we circulate them, they float. But eventually things are gonna disappear. Things are gonna get broken. Um, the nine volt battery and the therm thermometer reader is gonna die. And um, it wasn't assigned to a committee, which means it didn't have a budget, didn't have a, uh, any kind of money to um, get um, more um, materials, things that need to be replaced. And so, um, that's not to say that you can't do it. It's to say that you, you gotta have a plan going in. You know, is this gonna be attached to a committee? Is there gonna be a budget to help replace? Um, you know, we have a policies and procedures for everything, right? If it shows up and something's missing, what do you do? And a staff might not see one of these kits for three, four months, and all of a sudden they gotta remember where is this document, where, 
And then, of course, yeah, as we see in our libraries, people get promoted, they move on, and the information gets lost. And so you got to really think about where is this information going to be, how to make it easier as possible, uh, easy as possible for the staff, um, and that way it can be a successful um, kit, and it can everybody can be behind it. Um, so I think that's something that I'd like to say. If most libraries already have one, congratulations, <laughs> you're, you're doing you're doing great. If you're thinking about putting one together really thinking about um, where, who's gonna be working on it, who, where are they gonna live. A lot of our kids either float or um, they stay at a specific location. We had a set of ukuleles that were donated to a library and this person was giving classes and you know, it was great, but then the person moved away and the ukuleles didn't really have a home and now they're at my desk or they, they, they circulate, but that's where they all end up. But, but you know, we want to, to have these things, you just gotta have a plan to make it sustainable because you're gonna have a situation where things change in the kits, people leave, and, and as long as you have something in place and, and then you'll you get a lot more chance of success. I wanna jump in on that because one of the things you'll also wanna think about is how you'll maintain it. I mean, like just physically maintain it. Um, there was a request from someone who wanted to have a toilet snake in the Library of Things. <laughs> My question was who's gonna Who's going to wash it off? <laughs> and then that um, request mysteriously disappeared. Um, but you, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to have the procedures, um, and you need to know if you're willing to let things circulate without all the pieces being there. Um, we're going to be instituting a board game sort of thing, and, or a, a board game checkout, and we have already said, okay, if if it's, we're not gonna count every single piece. If someone tells us there's a problem, then we'll look at it, otherwise it just goes back out on the shelf. Yeah, and I, I, exactly, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, I, like I said before, I, I think it's important um, as we adapt as a library system, you know, we're not just shelves of, li of books and magazines, we're, we're offering these things because we think they're important. And so it's just a matter of making sure that they're gonna be sustainable, making sure you have a plan. Um, you know, and, and, and then also adapting, like the nine volt batteries we're dying in these kits, okay, we'll go out and buy recharging stations for them, buy batteries for the library. Like I said, you might not see this for six to eight months, and then I get the email saying my battery's dead, and I say, well, do you have the charger? And I get a charger question mark as a response, because no one knows even, well, who knows where it is, it's in a drawer somewhere. Um, but keep trying, it, it's, it's important, we just gotta come up with something and make sure you have people talking about it and, and adapting and, and making sure that we're able to keep it going. And not like getting too like hyper focused on every single, as you were saying, every single piece is in this thing. Like we can't ask circulation staff to do one more thing. You know what I'm saying? Like they already do a million things. So like what's the three most important things that always have to be returned in this kit? Like in a Lego Mindstorm, the brain has to come back. But if the other 500 little tiny pieces, like, I mean, who's going to count that? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> well, I was wondering, uh, that brings up kind of how, you were talking about the toilet, you know, cleaner. <laughs> and um, just how do you decide what things to add? What is the process that you guys go through to like add to these things? That, that's a great question. The first, um, the first was needs-based with our Wi-Fi hotspots. That was something that we found that there was a need for. Um, with the uh, grants, we were looking for themes, so indoor and outdoor sustainability. Um, we also ask, we get patron requests, of course, um, and then we decide with, with all of those things, whether it's something that the community seems like it actually will want, how much um, maintenance it's going to take, how expensive it is, because we need to decide if we're gonna get super high end or super cheap, which isn't really sustainable either. Um, so it's it's a really careful balancing act, just like any other part of your collection. I know at, in City of San Mateo, I've asked for a couple things to be added to the library of things, but typically it's based on, like there's a committee and they make decisions. And I think, you know, everybody knows the MiFi's and the Chromebooks are super high need pretty much whether you live in Los Gatos or East Palo Alto, like there's an aspect of the community that's gonna really need and be very grateful that they can check that out from the library. But in addition to those things, um, we 
there have been committees that have decided like which things would seem like they might be of interest to our community. And I would say that most of our library of things like really is pretty high circulating. Well, I'll usually get a recommendation and go to leadership and we'll talk about it and they'll say yes or no because a lot of it has to do with, you know, we'll, what we're going to be purchased, where is it going to be? But another big one for us is how do we get it to these libraries? We have, again, 26 libraries, so we can't have a central library of things location. It's not fair for people who don't live close to that location. And then we have to just talk to our shipping department and see. They have already have a set system of how they move our boxes around, how they move things around. We're going to add you know, 10, 12 different items of all different shapes and sizes. So all these things have to be considered. And so um, right now we're just taking it to our leadership team, letting them know what we want to add, why we want to add it, and, and if it's possible, we can try. But if not, then we'll have to revisit it another time. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I didn't know. We, we keep getting flash signs, so that is that relevant for? 10 minutes till you get to Q&A. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> I, I, I didn't really know. I was like, are there five minutes till, is it, uh, you know? Is it 3.40? <laughs> Sorry. Um, one of the things that also you guys will want to talk about is waivers. Um, that's another choice. I, w another suggestion was to possibly get a chainsaw, and the answer was no. <laughs> we will not be doing that. Um, we did talk to our city attorney and had the waiver drafted up and then we had it translated into our top three languages just so that that is something that um, we ask patrons to look at before they take out something that needs a wa waiver but not everything does. Um, I would also like to throw out there, I know Berkeley Public and Oakland both have very like extensive tool libraries. So if you want to be adding tools, they, I would reach out to them. Do you love the way whoever's here from those jurisdictions? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> just talk to Berkeley. Um, but I think that they've had those libraries for quite some time of object lending, and um, they probably have a lot more information about tools like a plumbing snake or a chainsaw. I know San Francisco many, many years ago in the 90s had a little bit of a tool library and you could check out things like weed whackers and lawnmowers. Um, so it can be whatever the chainsaw, but you know, every jurisdiction has its limitations and funding and so on. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge restriction. Working with the county, trying to get anything through um, the county legal is very challenging. So that's something that we also have to consider, absolutely. Well, along the same topic is evaluation. How do you, how are you evaluating how these programs are being, you know, accepted and like how to grow or which way to go? That, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that our new uh, programming framework and our checklist for programming has evaluation information on there, but we're still putting that together. So we are trying to create uh, some, some evaluations to, from staff to see how it worked on the staff side, asking patrons, um, but getting all that to work um, at all of our locations has been challenging, so we're, we're still working on our evaluation process. Ours is really, really informal. There's a QR code on each of those um, library of things. If there's a sustainability program, there's a QR code for a survey, but honestly, where we get the most feedback is from patrons themselves, just face-to-face -face saying, hey, I like this, or why did you buy this? <laughs> so for the library of things, I can't actually talk much about that because I'm not involved in it. But um, I mean, unless you count the seed library, which we just evaluate on the fact that it's, you know, always needs to be stocked. Um, and I will also say for any of you that have some, I, some concerns, like at the San Mateo and the two branches, Hillsdale and um, Marina, people don't just come in and like grab all the seeds and like run away. Like pe I know that <laughs> people are very selective. They really don't take like 20 seed packs if they're not gonna use them. I mean, I'm sure some people do because there's always that compulsion, but um, we've found that just based on observation because it's fairly close to the reference desk that people are very considerate about what they're taking. Um, but I would also like to throw out that, I mean, for survey or evaluation for our in-person programs, certainly there could be more 
extensive like analysis, but mostly we just still do stats and rely a lot on feedback. And I think like the most feedback I've gotten is from um, mending clinics and then fix it clinic is always like, when's the next fix it clinic? Um, I need to fix this coffee urn. <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't have the, like I said, we're working on the program evaluation, but we do have a survey for the library of things on our website as well, and we do have that. Okay, I mean, you've kind of t covered this in a few of the other areas, but are there any other, like, special challenges that you are, um, haven't brought up already? Um, well, I feel like I, that there are communities that are not being served by a lot of the sustainability programming that could be better served. And um, that's something that I feel like City of San Mateo could work on a little bit better. Um, you know, a lot of what happened the first year we got that grant was like, oh, we have all this money. Oh, we have to spend it really fast. Oh, there's um, only one permanent children's librarian and like, three positions to be filled. You know what I mean? Like it was like, there's no staff to do anything. So some of the things that maybe we should be doing, we sort of like back burnered. So what I would like to see is just a little bit more inclusion for communities that are not showing up to the library, which is I think just something overall that we can always be working on. One of the challenges that I've seen is that our Library of Things is really popular and it's a really um, visible collection and so it's very exciting. And But when people say, oh hey, I'd like to check out a sewing machine, great, you can have one in nine months. Um, doesn't really sell it, so that's probably one of the bigger challenges that I've seen is once you get over the procedures and you figure out who's going to do what and where this thing belongs, is you're excited about this Library of Things, the patron's excited, but there's just not enough money to, to bring it so that everybody can have everything. And I think that that's another thing is, is knowing that our audiences are, the sustainability isn't touching all the audiences we necessarily want to bring in. Yeah, I second all of that. I think that's pretty much what we're all dealing with in different ways. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then um, I guess I was kind of interested when that, the, on the last panel when they talked about like next steps or dreams. I know you were saying you were having a sustainability librarian and all these other things. Is there anything else that you think would be? I think that's a lot. I'm so yeah. excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be great if I could have that sustainability librarian um, be more than term limited. If we could get them on going, that'd be great. Um, I'd like us to look into the sustainability libraries initiative. Um, and I'd like to make sure that our library of things, like if I had all the money in the world, I'd make sure that our library of things is something that where there are, the holds are three to one and that um, we could get whatever anybody wanted and then we could do programming around them. That's something that's been kind of cool with having telescopes is um, we've been able to do programs with places like SETI, so the search for extra extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, we had a, a telescope program um, on Monday, um, but our our hold list for the telescopes that can actually be checked out is like 60 people. So it's really cool that we can do these programs, but I want I want everybody to have that telescope in their hands. Yeah, I, I kind of second that, but I mean, beyond the library of things, I also have interest in other parts of sustainability, but I don't know if it's a dream, but something that I feel like happened through partnerships is again, that other departments have taken over things that we started and just having more of that, like just maintaining and having those partnerships um, and keeping those relationships going and having new and other important sustainability things would be like my dream, but also just like within my workload. So it could be more like more of a, you do all this and I help you in this way, or you do this big thing and now I'm just coming there as outreach instead of doing all the promotion, organizing all the people that are coming to it, which um, we did for the compost giveaway. Well, I mean, I don't think we could call it a giveaway because the LSTA grant doesn't allow that. But um, we had a, the probably every, many of you in your cities, they give away the composted green waste, which can be a little dicey because it's not organic.
But the first year that we were, when we did the sustainability grant, we gave away seedlings and we had this big, like, here's the opening day of the compost and 75 people came and like, of the 75, I think only 10 had ever known that the city gave away compost. And then last year, solid, uh, solid waste kind of took it over. So I came and set up a library table, but they also had other organizations tabling there that day. And so I feel like next year it will just be like, hey, Carla, can you put this in the newsletter? And this is an <laughs> outreach opportunity. And like, that's my dreams. Like, let's start this going and let's just, it's not, I don't own it. Let's just everybody be doing it. I'd like to see more sustainable um, action in our buildings. Um, our libraries don't all have refillable water, for, water bottle stations. We don't all have the same kind of composting and recycling resources because having such a big system, some of our libraries are, are run by the county, some of our buildings are run by a city, some by a town, and they all have different things going on. Um, I'd like to see, we, we do have a G3 group within the county. We have someone from every department who participates to try to push these initiatives, but we keep running into these roadblocks because you know, one library might get it done very easily, but the other one just can't because of the bureaucracy that involved whatever city that is. So I'd like to see more support there for us, for staff, to have what we, what we are believe in. Uh, and I, I agree, I'd love to see a library things collection that just is almost unlimited and that patrons are really happy with and that staff are happy to be working with and not overwhelmed with. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we're going to open it for questions now, unless there's anything else you guys want to add before we open it up. Hello. <laughs> um, you've talked a lot about having not enough items to meet the demands of the public. And I sit here and I think about how many of us know somebody or have items in our homes that are sitting and collecting dust because we're not using them. Have maybe you considered asking the public, hey, bring in your sewing machine so other people can get a chance to use it. Or um, I'm not sure a weed whacker would really be a good idea. <laughs> but maybe it's something small that people can use either in a program or as like a outreach event where you get to meet that need without having to house it in the library, and then it goes back home with the person, so also you don't have to worry about missing parts or, you know, obviously there runs into the issue of like, uh, now a, a whole bunch of people have used my thing and now it's broken. So <laughs> I realize that there are issues with that, but yeah, maybe also potential? I, I, I th it's a wonderful idea. I'm gonna say <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think the problem is, once we start enacting it, we run into issues that we talked about earlier, like cataloging. You know, if we have a sewing machine in our library of things, but we have eight different brands or eight different styles, and you know, everything has to go in the catalog, all the items have to be listed. Um, so now we're creating eight different catalog entries for the same item. And again, parts will break. How do we replace them? Um, I guess we could just say, well, it just goes away, but it's just not very sustainable. I, I think the idea of trying to get things that are out in the community into other people's hands is, is great, um, but I don't see how we could make that happen, at least in our library of things. Um, just to speak about sewing machines specifically, um, those are, if anyone in the room who sews knows that a sewing machine can be super finicky, so a donated sewing, we actually do have some sewing machines that were donated, but also our sewing machines don't circ in the library of things, but they do get used. Um, and, you know, there's a big difference between the baby locks we purchased for the grant and the Singer sewing machine that's like a little bit finicky and Carla knows the little like wiggle <laughs> waggle and one other person knows. So I think that that actually is, I. To me, part of the library of things isn't just this person can't afford a sewing machine. It's also like, I want to try sewing. Oh, I didn't like that. I'm not buying a sewing machine. Or I want to try hiking poles. These aren't for me. Or these are the best things ever. I'm going to use them all the time. So when you get donations, it's just like the different caliber of donations can be very complicated. I, I agree with everything they said. I love the idea. I, in fact, that's something we discussed when we were starting the Library of Things is, hey, can we get things from the public? But with not knowing the provenance, like what's actually happened to that poor sewing machine, 
<laughs> or that poor toilet snake. Um, <laughs> we we, we want to make sure that um, we're giving things to the patrons that they can be safe with as well. So, yeah. And one thing I would say on that point is like what Carla brought up before was the swaps. I mean, that was one thing that I know for us, it was like it's an easy free program and you get your community to be able to exchange like all kinds of stuff. I, I guess you could try a weed whacker, you know, a, <laughs> a garden tool. I mean, we've done crafts and plants and I don't know what other ones you guys have done, but that is one method instead of having it in-house. Yep. Hi there, thank you. Uh, my name is James. I really appreciate your, uh, your perspectives. Um, several of you spoke about the seed libraries that you run in your libraries. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how sustainable those seed libraries have been. Are they ventures that um, you've been able to maintain with uh, just community donations of like locally grown plants? Or is it the case that you've had to purchase resources to keep the program going? I was just wondering if you'd give me a little more info about that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think we've been really lucky with our C libraries. They're, they're growing. We've got 16 in our 26 libraries, and they're supported a number of ways. Um, we have one main library where it started. I think that's the Antioch Library. And when a new library wants to start, they've been able to help um, give them seeds. But, but usually, if, if well, I've seen emails where libraries running out of seeds, other libraries come to the rescue. It seems that we have a pretty good collection throughout our library system and a lot of cooperation um, within the different libraries to help each other out. Uh, like I said earlier, I think Home Depot and Ace Hardware um, helped a couple of locations get started. Um, but they're really relying on some garden clubs and a lot of great volunteers. And it is a trade system, so you're not, uh, some libraries will have a limit um, of what you can take, but most say, you know, bring something and take something, or just take something if you can't bring something. So, so far what I've seen is our collection has been able to, um, to not just, be maintained but to grow a bit so so far so good so we have like a little combination of a couple different things um so our library foundation helps fund the purchase of seeds we have a component of um people who collect seeds from you know i don't know if anyone here is a gardener but if you grow parsley and you let it go to seed like you can give the, the that's like one of those seeds that is very easy to like use every single year with great success. So people seed collect and they share those seeds with us. And then we recently got a donation from a small local garden center for like, it was astronomically like mind blowing donation. <laughs> um, and then we also purchase our seeds in bulk and we distribute them. So if somebody d gave us like a seed pack of zucchini, we would split it because no, any, again, any gardener in this room knows that they don't want to have like 12 or however many, 20 zucchini plants. You usually just want <laughs> two, maybe three, depending on the size <laughs> of your garden. So we do, we, ours is a little bit more labor intensive, but I, we're finding ways to kind of streamline it. But that's sort of, ours is a combination of donation, funding from our foundation, and then the seed collecting that's done by local gardeners. And didn't you guys also have a program of how to collect seeds yes. too? Yes, so already mentioned and probably a well-known resource for everyone in this room are the Master Gardeners in California. They offer amazing programming. They're a quick and easy. We have a sustainability program known as the Master Gardeners, and they will give you programs from anything from compost, tomatoes, to seed saving. So they did give a seed saving presentation at our library. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when you started creating your library of things, or when you're introducing new larger collections of certain types of things, do you ever meet with resistance from, from the rest of the library staff on this? And if so, how do you overcome that? <laughs> One of my library staff members is here. <laughs> I would say that there's actually usually not much resistance. The resistance is usually coming from me, um, just because I'm, I am thinking about the waivers. Um, 
And no, usually my staff are more excited about getting stuff going than I am. So I, I'm going to say my staff are awesome, and I've not had any resistance. Where are we going to put it? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, sorry, you're right. That is, that is the question, where are we going to put this? And that, I think you guys probably have that same question. So where are we going to put it? Oh, definitely, that, that's a big concern. And so uh, the only time I've ever heard it is in maybe a conversation somewhere where I just hear it. I'm like, I'm just sick of getting those kits. I gotta count everything. But it, it's not, I haven't got any official emails about that. I think, like I said, I think what we need to do is make sure that the staff has got an understanding of what they need to do and it's not overwhelming. We're not gonna count every piece yeah. in that thing. And so um, I, think, I think overall staff are encouraged and they want to do these things. Um, but as we get, you know, workloads increase, 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 and then we want to add, add things. We, we just have to consider staff, we really do. And I think if you consider staff, bring them into the conversation, then you will have an easier time going forward. I would also just point out that we are asking a volunteer to help with the board games. So that is something we're trying to offload to staff so that if there is a large, like if there does seem to be a problem with the games, that's the volunteer is the person who can do the counting. And I don't have someone, a librarian having to count every single Monopoly hotel. Um, I feel like at the City of San Mateo Public Library, we uh, staff want to have more things, but it's really more than anything space to where do you store these things. Um, but I feel like the other part of that is because we're one main library with two branches, it's people who have a passion for a certain thing can usually run with it. So, you know, first we had a lot of musical instruments and then um, we got the parks grant and we had a lot of objects related to hiking. And so it, for us, I believe it's more, where do you put it? And then of course, I mean, funding, would, I guess is like, and everybody has that issue. And if you don't, tell us where you hide the bags of money. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I really appreciated this panel. I'm Paula. I work here at the San Francisco Public Library. Um, I noticed we have a, a really strong theme of trying to mitigate climate change, and I was wondering um, if you all had some thoughts about how we're responding to um, climates already changing. For example, I saw a lot of photos of like libraries in North Carolina and the flood being the only place that had Wi-Fi available. Here on this hot day, some of our branches have to close because we don't have AC or heat pumps or anything like that. And so I know a couple of you were talking about buildings and like how do we just provide space for people as we're dealing with the effects of moving into the future? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. We um, are designated as a cooling center and a heating and a warming center um, in the summer and, well, actually year round, I suppose. <laughs> um, so we're doing that. I also, um, we're also working with our local EOC, Emergency Operations Center, um, to make sure that we are working with them in terms of shelter and making sure that we can also provide a space for community resilience. Um, I'm also connected with our community emergency response team or the CERT team, and I actually encourage all of you who are interested in climate change, sustainability, or community resilience to get in touch with those folks because they have ham radios and all sorts of things, and they will be happy to help make you more resilient and make your buildings more resilient as well. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer. I think two of our libraries are closed right now because of heat. Um, and so, you know, not all of our facilities have AC, unfortunately, but the ones that do, do offer cooling spaces. Um, but, uh, you know, we have some small locations in some areas. And I think the OSHA temperature limit recently dropped, requiring it, it's even lower now. So we've had uh, one particular library close, I think, for a couple of weeks because of the heat. Uh, and so, unfortunately, it's just affecting everybody, um, but we're doing what we can. That question might be above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that, um, I mean, certainly there's a lot more people using the library when it's this hot out. And our library, if you've ever been there, we have a couple, a very large community space. And that is, you know, it is an emergency center potentially. But, you know, if there was a flood, like, you know, if whatever it was, 31 trillion gallons of water came down on the Bay Area, like, would that be flooded? I don't, you know, at a, again, above my pay grade. 
Hi there. Um, another question over here. Um, just thinking in terms of sustainability, and and one of the things that you brought up repeatedly is space and having the space to house all things that are needed by many different demographics, I would imagine. Um, has there been any talk in like collaborating with other with library systems and obtaining a warehouse space or something like that and then creating kind of like a link plus or interlibrary loan system? I want your contact information. <laughs> I think that's a fabulous idea. Something I came across um, is uh, PLA is gonna be having a library of things webinar coming up in later this month and one of the people there has put together a like a spreadsheet where if your item is not circulating, you can swap it for for someone else's something or another that, that's not circulating for them. And um, one of my librarians was like, we need to set up a Discord to do this. And I was like, wow, I need to go with the administration first. But I love the idea. I think that's a fabulous idea. I'd, I'd love to see us do something like that. Oh, I agree. I, I, our administrative office, I, I think, believe we're looking for a new location, and I think one of the things we're considering is storage space. So it's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, this is semi-related, but for the fix-it clinics, they do happen in the whole county of San Mateo, and um, the county of San Mateo, San Mateo Sustainability Office purchased tools that fit into all the bins for Peninsula Library System. So we do share tools for Fix-It Clinic between all the, all the libraries and Peninsula Library System when there's a Fix-It Clinic. So that's not exactly what you're asking, but it sort of relates to like the whole you know, sharing idea. And I like that because um, one thing that came up uh, through like the state library grant is how many people were doing seed libraries. And there is some information out there for general so we don't all keep on like reinventing the wheel, because there is a lot of different shared information for seed libraries, for libraries out there. Any others? Uh, yeah, one of our goals is to make our internal work processes more sustainable. Do you have any tips? on uh, how to make the library workspaces more sustainable or, or what types of internal sustainability efforts have you implemented or suggested to implement at your library? That's a really good question. Um, and I think one thing we you really need to do is look at streamlining. Um, the circulation staff, don't, for our library of things, it's all done by reference staff. They, we, sh we have a shared desk. And so it's streamlined, so circulation staff doesn't have to you know, do this. The person who is more of the expert on it is checking it in and checking it out. You can use our um, QR code here, hopefully it works. If not, we have paper evaluation forms as you exit. Um, so thank you so much uh, for coming out today. Again, I wanna thank the committee members um, and acknowledge uh, the Pacific Library Partnership staff and staff from the San Francisco Public Library for their support of this event. As a final note, uh, the recordings of this conference will be uploaded and available um, soon on the PLP website. Um, thank you for attending. We hope to see you at next year's Future of Libraries. Thanks. Uh, yes, a reminder, please, uh, as a uh, move towards sustainability, we encourage you to leave your badge at the desk so we can use it again next year. Thanks so much. <laughs>